Hi, everyone. This is Matt from Healthy Framework. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Steph Safran, owner of Steph in the City. Steph, thank you so much for joining today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's jump right into it. Can you tell me what separates Steph in the City from the rest of the matchmaking services that are out there? Well, one of the things that I do a little bit differently is the way that I approach it for both men and women, because there is a difference in how men and women date. So I only take on men for what I call proactive matchmaking services. What that means is the men are paying me the big, the big bucks to do the search as though I was a recruiter, but the women also get some of the same respects um, in terms when I'm matching them, they do have um, a piece of the pie. They do pay um, a much smaller amount, but they are paying to meet with me and they are paying to, you know, um, get the same information about the match that the men do. And what people like about that, particularly the men, is they like to know that the women um, have a say in it because they don't want to just be matched up with people who are hoping maybe, well, if I go out with this guy, she'll set me up with more guys. Yeah. And that's number one. Number two, I really do focus on the idea that a lot of people need dating coaching, but not for the reasons that people might think. It doesn't mean you don't know how to date, but most of us are not in looking for entry-level dating anymore. And what that means is the people who are giving advice, if you were to go and ask somebody, how do I go and meet people? They're going to give you experiences that could be 15 years old. They're going to be saying, I mean, who's going right now and checking for jobs in the paper? That's what I did back in the day. Who's looking for jobs on Monster? You know, Monster. Right. No one. So when people go and look and say, well, go try this app or this site, it's also based on location. So let's say um, the app itself is based out of San Francisco and you're in Chicago. You're not going to get the same level of attention. And so a lot of people get very frustrated because they take it very personally because we've gone into an age where we think everything's Amazon Prime and we can order it instantly. And people don't like hearing well, this might take a little time because we need to put your best foot forward and we need to have your action plan. So when you do meet somebody that if that person doesn't work out, you're going to bounce back quicker and go back. And for many people, really what they're looking for, the reason they're looking to meet somebody is that they miss the companionship that is not just of a romantic relationship, but of a friendship. Yeah. And so for a lot of people, if they have good friends that they can relate to at this point in their life, the romantic relationship takes a back seat and isn't the primary focus. And that's what I say is the dating coaching component, because yeah. most of us do not have a way of making new adult friends um, that isn't on text messaging. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And and that was a good parlay, I think, to this next one. And you touched on it a bit because, you know, wanted to inquire um, the ideal customer step in the city's design for. So it sounds like primarily men, but it, it looks like you touch on both, then, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. The ideal customer, I'm going to say, is anywhere from 20s to 50s. And um, for people who have just moved to the area, they could really benefit from my coaching because I'm going to explain, well, let's come up with the best marketing plan for you. So somebody who's just out of school and says, hey, I moved to Chicago or I'm leaving from a suburb or what do I do? How do I meet people? So it isn't just, you know, the coaching aspect is more affordable for more of an average person where, you know, whereas the matchmaking is more for somebody who is um who has more who has gotten more experience and may need somebody to to do it for them um in a way that look a 25 year old doesn't need my it has more options yeah and as far as women goes I'm very good with um helping women as well it's just that I don't want to waste anybody's money and spend five figures to do matchmaking when I can't just walk up to men and be like, hey, you're six feet. Would you date a five one woman? Right, now right. you can flip it on the other side. Yes. But I'm going to say that the best customer is going to be willing to listen to me, what I call the 80% rule. You can throw out 20% of what I tell you. You don't have to agree with it. And we're going to, you're going to give me an 80% commitment that of the things I'm asking you to do, we're going to throw a bunch of different things 
because there is no magic one size fits all. Yeah. So the the easiest way I can say is the customer that is willing to work with me and willing to do the homework and willing to listen to me at least 80% of the time, that would be my dream yeah, customer. Perfect. I like it. And you're doing great with the the segue on the questions because you just touched a bit on, on price point and, and something that we hear often is concerns for folks that haven't, you know, hired a matchmaker before, right? So something that's pretty clear is that hiring a personalized matchmaker like yourself or some of the services you provide is more expensive than using a traditional dating app, let's say Hinge, Tinder, uh, or anything along those lines. How would you rationalize those costs to somebody that might be concerned about the higher price tag? Well, you, you made it really easy for me to talk about timing. Uh, Match.com, which basically owns every uh, dating app now, is now offering a premium service for about $500 a month. Guess what? You can spend $3,000 for my coaching and I can give you a lot. I bet you I can get you a lot more personalized attention and dates if we work together. Um, and my cost is $3,000 and we have an action plan um, that is much more detailed than maybe this curated $500. Yeah. Now, um, the other situation is with as far as the matchmaking goes, sometimes when people come to me, um, the 10,000 plus price tag is very, sounds high to them. And maybe when they find out what the coaching entails, maybe the coaching is enough that they that I say I'm cheaper than therapy and I can get you results. <laughs> and I can also give you new best friends and you get unlimited um, new friendships. So, you know, sometimes these friendships are the places that are going to help you actually meet people to date, even on the idea that these people on the apps, um, you know, you're nameless, faceless. Sometimes these people, you start getting to know them, at, you know, through other things that you do. And then you can be like, oh, wait, I saw them at this event I went to and they're single. Mm -hmm. Now I can hit them up because I've actually met them. So, and when people find out when you've done the homework, I am definitely very fair price because there are some places that won't even start talking to you until it's 25,000. Yeah. So, you know, but the idea that free is good, look where it got us so far. Right. No, it makes sense. And a very solid explanation in terms of justifying the expense and things there uh, with it. Shifting gears a little bit, would you say if somebody's interested or, or thinking about a matchmaker, are there any potential drawbacks to using a matchmaker that people should be aware of? Well, I think one of the things people have to understand is that um, a good matchmaker is going to be honest with you. And they're going to tell you things like I don't I tell people generally to stay off the apps, for example, between Thanksgiving through New Year's, because a lot of people who are not so happy are going to be on there. So the same would apply if you want to start with a matchmaker and we say to you, hey, I'm going to need a little bit of lead time. You're not going to go out with someone next week. You're not going to get um, a million people to, you know, like maybe you're used to, you're going to pick through all these piles. You know, what I explain to people is we need some time to make sure that also the people I'm setting you up with, I get enough feedback so that we are not wasting matches just to, you know, again, rush you to have a date for a wedding or something. So I think the drawback is people think that we make magic people. And the reason my prices have had to go up is I deal with the same flakiness you guys deal with, yeah. but I've been charging for my meetings forever. So I know now, and for the people who didn't, and they're like, well, but I don't want my time wasted. So I, I think the biggest drawback is people have to understand that, that again, just because I introduce you to somebody, um, it doesn't mean that that is going to be your forever person. If that was the case, the bachelor wouldn't have a bunch of divorces because they really focus on it. Yeah. But I, but I do believe that um, a good matchmaker will be honest and and want to invest time making sure that you're dressed okay, making sure your conversation skills, making sure that you don't go into it negatively. I mean, I I put a lot of my gentlemen on practice dates before we go out, and I get a lot of fighting with me. But ultimately, they get it. And I send them to a stylist. Yeah. I've had men do their eyebrows or their hair or anything. And I keep saying that these things are temporary, but we want to get you past the first interview. Yeah. So I think the tough thing is it's an emotional process. There are no guarantees. But if you do listen to at least 80%, I really do have a good 
um, corner on getting people into relationships, whether it's through my coaching or through my matchmaking. Excellent. No, uh, more wonderful uh, feedback there. Uh, shifting a little bit more there, and I know you've touched on bits and pieces of this through some of the other answers, but would you say there's anything unique about the way that you might find matches for someone? <laughs> Well, since I've been in this business for a long time, I started out um, uh, doing getting matches for a, comp a, a show called The Dating Game. Um, I'm not completely that old where yeah. it was Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. time. But what people might not realize is, a lot. you know, I lived in Los Angeles. And when people were getting people for these game shows, a lot of the people who'd go, when I do say Arnold Schwarzenegger and some of these other people, they were, that was used as a way into the entertainment industry. So you were dealing with a lot of models and people who were looking for more than just a date. So I do have experience where I literally would go to the clubs and get people in that regard. Then I worked for another company where at that time you would wear little black dresses and go to multiple places as well. So I've seen this go through different transitions. I also uh, went to a matchmaker and I said, I could do a better job. So I, I do have some of that personal experience, but what I do do that's unique is I'm a very good networker. And so I look at each and every opportunity. I was at the gym this morning. I saw a woman gave her a compliment. I mean, it's a shocking thing, but, it, and she told me that she was a biker. Well, I'm a biker. So I told her, I said, are you single? And she said, yeah. I said, well, here's my card. If you're interested, I said, I know of some biking groups I can tell you about. Now that's not the hard sell because is this somebody I could work with? You know, I know other matchmakers, but the thing was, is I look at this and, and again, I've had people call me up and say, oh, I'm so ready. And oh, I met somebody. And then they call me six months later. Okay, it didn't work out. I said, this is par for the course. I mean, right. I don't get mad at people when they say they met somebody. I just say, I'll take you, you know, if it doesn't work out. I had one guy, um, another Matt, of course, because a lot of my clients right now are named Matt. I'm not giving much away because they're all Matt. But um, I actually, he told me the description. Um, he was in his twenties. I said, I'll see you in three months. And I was right on. And then he dated somebody else while we were working together. And I said, this is going to be, this is going to last six months, six months later. Yeah. And we were working together at that time. And so um, ultimately I was able to give him some predictions about, you know, these, everyone thinks they're unique in, in dealing with, with their problems in the romantic field. Um, everyone's coming to me because something's broken, not because it's fixed. So, you know, the objective here is, it's not just about meeting that person. It's what if you find out that this person is not right for you? What are your bottom lines? Because there are people who spend too much time with people that there's chemistry, but there's no future. And there's people who who say, but this is the first, per this is my drought. It's been so long. And so we also have to come up with, well, what are your things that you need to stay away from? Like, if you know you'll drink a little too much, don't do a drinking date. Or if you don't want to bring things into the mix about, you know, any sort of, um, you know, romantic entanglement, don't go out on a Friday or Saturday night right away. That's okay. There's no hard and fast rule about what is a specifically good date. But the rule of thumb is the length of time that you spend with somebody is not equivalent to how interested they are. In you. Yeah, that uh, makes sense. Uh, something that I've been interested in, it's been uh, fun talking to some other matchmakers and things to see is, have you struggled before to find an ideal match for a client? And if so, what's your process when that happens? I, I don't think there's any matchmaker that hasn't struggled with this. Number one, I'm part of what's called the Matchmaker Alliance, which is a, a, a group with international um, uh, you know, um, ties and I know other people in the business. I have a business partner I work with who is in Chicago. We, um, both, um, hit on different types of matches. She will call herself the geriatric matchmaker, which is pretty popular, I guess, with the golden bachelor. Yeah. Um, and I had stated that I'm in the twenties to fifties mark. She's like fifties and up. And we will work together. That's one option is to have another matchmaker work with you. Another is to put out a casting call. Um, and another is to kind of, you know, uh, go across some social media, ask a few people who you know are people who are the introductionistas in your mm -hmm. world. There, there's, I mean, I have a real estate guy. He always knows great single people. And then I go back and give him some real estate. 
Um, you know, people, these are people that might be on the market, but I will tell you, I certainly have had people that have come back to me after I have set up somebody that they liked working with me, even if it wasn't the right person. And then they brought their friend in and I got their friend Mary. <laughs> so it, it, you know, and, and I've had clients that use me as a matchmaker and then, okay, they didn't meet their match and their things, but their advice brought way to, they told, they credit me with finding their partner and they're, and I've always been surprised at some of the men yeah. that I thought for sure, oh my God, they don't want to work with me or whatever. And then they were my, they were the nicest people when it came down to it. They said, well, Steph, you really gave me some, some information I didn't have. Yeah. And, 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 and I've had people that came back to me that I, that like disappeared for a few months and I found out they'd gone online um, with the advice I'd said, and they met their partner and they were, they were telling me they were engaged to be married. So I wish I could say I was invited to all these weddings. I'm not, but, <laughs> but because again, there is a little bit of embarrassment on some level still, but the thing is, at least they're coming back and telling me, Hey, I credit you. And I, I got one about three weeks ago and yeah. I worked with her in 2018 and it, it really felt wonderful to wake up on a Monday and hear that she had made it to the other side. Yeah, oh, that's great. And that all makes sense uh, there. Um, something I was interested in, I spent a very small amount of time in Chicago myself, but you know, your service is mainly available there. Would you say that there's anything unique about dating in Chicago that you'd be able to share with us? Well, I've lived in Madison, Wisconsin for college. I've lived in the city for over 20 years at this point, and I've also lived in Los Angeles. So I think everybody thinks that wherever they're living, it's harder to date. And what I've noticed is, um, you know, from living in the city and living in other places that are city, it comes down to what, you know, if you match what the city is like. So let's say you um, are very religious and conservative. That's not what a lot of the city is. That might be the surrounding suburbs. So what's going to make things easier or harder is, um, is, is based on, you know, are you living in the right location for who you are and the types of people you want to meet? Not just in the dating world, too. Mm -hmm. And so there are challenges when people live with their parents, which they do, and they don't realize it because they're like, well, once I meet someone, I'll live with it. I'll live with, you know, live with them. And it depends on the age. I mean, if you're 25, it's normal enough, you know, but if you're 35, when are you moving out? Right. Um, and, and I do think the challenge is, is that there is a lot of opportunity. So you might find that people might be a little flakier because you're not in Michigan or Indiana where there's a smaller pool. So the bigger the pool, it's the paradox of choice, which is a book out there that you go to a grocery store and you have all these selections. It doesn't make it easier. A lot of times it makes it harder. Yeah. Yeah. That reminds me like the uh, Cheesecake Factory menu every time I go, which has been a while. It's just, it's like overload <laughs> Let us um, rest. with it. Well, excellent. So to close one last question, which is one of my favorite ones always is to see is, do you have a favorite success story that you'd be able to share with us? I do. Um, I, I, I have a, quite a few, but one, you know, stands out to me that is more relevant now than it would have been. And I had a client that came to me, he had lost, he was, um, about 35 and he had lost his wife to breast mm -hmm. cancer. And at the time, this is probably about 15 years ago. This was not something you heard of as much as, you know, people losing people, um, you know, and being younger and widowed. And I think if he would have gone online, he might have had a lot more issue because at that time, I think apps were not the big thing, but sites were. And people just still had this idea, well, you know, this person still, they didn't have children together. And basically I set him up and his fourth match was his wife. And it was really nice to hear that you know, that again, when you have the ability to talk to people personally and be like, look, mm -hmm. checked his house. He's not, there's no memorial. His, the other side wants him to meet somebody else. When you have that ability to give the reassurance, you know, that is somebody who might've had trouble online. And I, I'll throw in one more. I had a guy five, six and chunky. I thought for sure this guy, I was about to take him out and do a bunch of coaching. Yeah. 
And I had another guy who was six one, really good looking in shape. And I was going to set up this one woman with him. And all of a sudden he's like, yeah, she's not, you know, she's 10 pounds heavier than when I want, whatever. So I call her back. I'm like, look, I'm really sorry, but this guy, um, it's not going to work out. I do have this other guy and here's his story. He's a little chunky and he's five, six. And she said, okay, yeah. she married him. Wow. Yeah. I think sometimes we have so, to get out of our own way, so to speak, right? Like we might have these preconceived notions, but you being the professional and the matchmaker can help steer folks. Well, here's the thing. I thought she would say no. She surprised me. That's what I'm saying. Like, I thought, oh, if I have to put my bets down on who are going to be the people who are going to get married and who are going to be the easier people, I've been wrong. And so my thought was I was prepared for him because I think this was match five or six. I was so prepared. I was like, we're going to do this and we're going to do all this coaching. Yeah. And lo and behold, she's like, sure, I'll meet him. And the next thing I know, she's ha super happy. And I wasn't expecting that. So sometimes it's really nice when you basically don't plan on that wouldn't have been who I would have put to set yeah. him up with. And, and it worked out. That's amazing. So I would say, I would say that, you know, just like everybody else, we don't always know what's going to work, but what, we, what I do know is you have to figure out how you're going to deal with with any of the challenges you face, because no matter who you're going to meet, you're going to face challenges. And if you've had the foresight to already prepare and say, look, every around three months, this is when all my relationships don't work out. Well, what can you do differently? You know, and, and again, I tell people, you know, don't get naked with anybody unless you're going to be in a relationship. And then still don't do it too early mm -hmm. because you can't go backwards. So, you know, if that means doing things on a Thursday night when you have to go to work the next day or doing um, a, um, a, a day event for quite a few weeks, you know, people have to be more intentional about what's best for them yeah. because nobody knows yeah. you better than you. And I can help you. But at the end of the day, there is still responsibility on you to make sure that you stick with those things that are important to you so that you don't, you know, say, but I invested two years in here. Well, <laughs> yeah. you shouldn't have invested two years if you're unsure. Yeah. 25 is very different than 35. Yeah. So I, I will just say that I, I always say this, everybody who comes to me, whether they're the prom queen or the nerd has the same issues at the end of the day. They haven't found the person that they want to be with. Yeah. So it, there's no, you know, if you're attractive or if you have to lose weight, it doesn't mean you're going to have an easier, or harder time. Sometimes things are really the luck of the draw and people have to be open to understanding that everything is not personal dating sites. They're still companies. Yeah. They're still trying to make money off of you. Yeah, now that makes sense. Well, really appreciate all the insights today. It was great getting to learn about the business and more about you. Definitely thank you again, Steph, for joining. Uh, appreciate the time. Excited to maybe check in and do a future interview again in another three, six months or something, but would love to stay in touch. But thank you so much again for joining and take time to help us understand a little bit more about Steph in the City. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Sure, thank you.